So when, uh, when Joan and I were starting BuzzFeed, uh, I was, one of the things I was really struck by was um, that all the issue-driven content producers I was talking to were really hungry uh, to better understand the impact that their that their work was having on you know in a in a in a real way on the social issues they were addressing. And uh, as I thought about it more, it seemed really fascinating to me that with the billions of dollars getting spent on cause marketing and issue feature driven features and television, that we were still uh, as an industry measuring our impact through Facebook likes and monthly UVs and click-through rates. That seemed inconceivable to me. And I dug into it a little more and discovered that the reason we were still doing that was because going beyond that was actually a really, really tough data science problem and social science problem. And then I got super interested and obsessed even and dropped everything and went back to school uh, went back and uh, did a applied quantitative research program, which was very new to me because I was a filmmaker by training, you know, someone from the arts, uh, and found a group of people who were equally obsessed with this kind of juicy cheeseburger of uh, a big problem for, for media. Uh, apologies to vegetarians in the audience. Um, <coughs> And, uh, and we formed this institute and started working with uh, large foundations and clients like MTV who were making significant media investments around issues and wanted to get a better sense of how they were doing. And we learned a lot and have uh, published some papers and, and uh, uh, had some insights and I'll share some of those insights later, but the thing I'm here to talk to you about this morning is the glimpse of a potential future that my time there somewhere near the cutting edge of data and media impact uh, has afforded me. Um, and so I'd like, to, I'd like to talk about that a little bit and talk about how I think we got there. Uh, and then wrap with some hopefully optimistic uh, signs of maybe a counter trend. Uh, uh, so, so I'd like to I'd like to start uh, uh, with two vignettes of this possible and in fact very likely future, uh, to my mind. Uh, let's imagine together a man driving in his car on the highway, listening to an interactive program in his car, and a family, a pa uh, some parents watching their child at home play a massive multiplayer game online. Uh, the man gets uh, a sudden craving for food and finds an exit, pulls off, and goes and has a meal. And the parents uh, watch edu educational content come up in the context of this game and begin to congratulate themselves for being such hip media savvy parents picking the right, picking the right uh, content for their child. Um, and you probably <laughs> guessed by the title card and by the angle of my talk so far that there's more to these vignettes than I've shared so far and that's, that's correct. So the man has been targeted at his precise location uh, by messages that, uh, uh, first of all, he's turned off location services in his phone, but that doesn't matter because he can't turn off the GPS in his car, and that's been linked to his customer profile, which is, it includes his eating habits. Uh, and he's been targeted by messages that take into account how long he's been driving and have been optimized to maximize the statistical likelihood that when he is primed with that message, he will convert uh, from a listener to a customer. The parents uh, are experiencing the marketing campaign of the game publisher, a new marketing campaign where they which, uh, in which they focus not their users, which are the kids 
in this particular game, but the purchase deciders. And when the camera on the console detects the purchase deciders in the room, it activates this marketing campaign promoting educational content. Uh, the rest of the time, when they're not there, <laughs> <coughs> the game continues. So, <laughs> so obviously these stories bring up privacy concerns, but that's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. I think there's actually a more pressing issue than that. Um, we are looking at a future where people with access to data are going to have not just incredible reach, but also the ability to optimize messages for maximum persuasiveness. So we are looking at a future where advertisers, uh, advertising marketing, corporate communications will have a stunning, stunning new kind of power to reach us in what feels like a very individual way with very, very persuasive messages. Uh, what that future, the uh, groups that future will not be so good for are people who don't have access to that kind of data. So uh, typically journalists, uh, independent media producers, uh, issue advocates who are creating media that they, where they want to change hearts and minds around an issue that really matters to them. Those groups have traditionally related to data in, in terms of researching their audience and understanding their audience better as a kind of taboo. Um, and they're going to find themselves in this future battle for attention completely outgunned. They're going to find that their messages, besides compromised reach, just don't feel as effective as they used to be in contrast to everything else out there. Because they're going to be missing, they're going to be missing these tools. Um, now, why are we looking at a future like that? Uh, and, and just in case you're, you're thinking to yourself, no, 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 look, that can happen in finance. Finance is kind of overly quantified, but, but, uh, but it's not going to happen in entertainment and media. We're too creative. It's too complex. The algorithms will just get it wrong. Uh, this is a book, Clinical Versus Statistical Prediction, by a psychologist, Paul Meal. And uh, uh, this, uh, well, first of all, let me, take, let me take a quick poll. You're experiencing symptoms. Uh, would you rather be, uh, so clinician versus algorithm, would you rather be diagnosed by a clinician or an algorithm? Clinician, who would, raise your hand if you'd rather be diagnosed by a clinician, okay. Fair show of hands for the clinician. And then by an algorithm. Very few. Well, the second group, thank you, the second group would statistically have a better survival rate because as it turns out, uh, when this book was published, algorithms did a far, far better job at identifying, <coughs> at uh, correctly diagnosing symptoms. Uh, now, this was published in 1959. And part of, <laughs> part of the reason, if you haven't heard about this, part of the, I'm going to talk about part of the reason for that, but um, uh, things have only gotten better from the point of view of accuracy and being able to take on new, complex, challenging problems from here. Uh, so, so why are we looking at a future like this? Uh, in my mind, it's largely because this conversation around data and media and entertainment uh, and optimization has, has been dominated by a conversation between two groups of people. Uh, two with two different mental models and approaches to the world and values. The first group I think of as the Enlightenment group, and I think of Rene Descartes, the French philosopher and mathematician, as their patron saint. And uh, 
our friends in the Enlightenment group, uh, you know, they can be, en they tend to be engineers and people working with data and, uh, or can be people in business, et cetera, um, derive a lot of their personal values directly from these Enlightenment values. That's where, you know, faith was supplanted by reason as the way we understand the world and we could use our intellect to, uh, to understand the world by understanding the different parts of the world, breaking it up into parts. And our friends in the Enlightenment group are very good, they're very good at, at, at using scientific method. That is, you know, following a rigorous uh, sequence of testing hypothesis to get to a greater truth. They're very good with quantitative <laughs> measurement. Uh, and because they're amassing that kind of data, they're very good at prediction. It allows us to do things like land somebody on the moon uh, with strong likelihood of success. And they're very curious. They want to land on the moon. You know, they want to land on that thing out there. They're very curious about the outside world. And this group uh, has its counterpart. And I think of the other group as the romantics because a lot of their, and this is their patron saint, Mary Shelley, <laughs> the person I think of as their patron saint, the author of Frankenstein. And, uh, and uh, our friends uh, in the romantic group have their values too. Uh, emotion, uh, that, that, that reason isn't the only way we can relate to things, that emotion is actually really important, perhaps even more important. Uh, that intuition is another way to experience and understand the world and uh, do that through aesthetic experiences. And I would guess that there are a fair amount of storytellers in this room and you know what I'm talking about. You know, that's how we, it turns out, you know, our neurobiology is wired to receive truth through stories. Um, and Sure enough, our friends in the romantic group are great storytellers. They're great with qualitative data. They're good at description. And they're very curious too, but they're curious in words, typically. They want to understand motive and thought and emotion. And uh, in fact, one of the uh, romantic eras, great critique of the Enlightenment was, hey, Enlightenment, you're so, you know, you want to understand the world so much, but you dummies, you can't understand the world until you understand the mind that's trying to understand the world. Uh, don't you get it? Um, so these two groups have, you know, this is not a new battle. This is an old battle, but a new front in this battle that is creating uh, a, a kind of stoppage. Uh, and in the sense that uh, these two groups have their own distinct flaws. Um, our friends in the Enlightenment tend to be a little hubristic and overreaching and, uh, and, and lack reflection, can lack reflection. And our romantics, uh, who I think of, you know, as a lot of romantics in the filmmaking uh, uh, sector, uh, can be sentimental and said in one ways. I'm old enough to remember filmmaking friends of mine saying, I will never shoot on video. I will never use an Avid. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so, so our romantics can be a little, a little set in their ways. And the way they have reacted to this discussion of incorporating data, not just into bottom line decisions, but starting to incorporate it into their creative practice has either been, uh, for the most part, one of la 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 la, I can't hear you. I'm gonna go to the coffee shop and write in my Moleskine notebook and just pretend <laughs> that this, <laughs> this wave is not about to overtake and change everything I do. Or attacking in a really unconstructive way, in a way that yields a kind of binary result. And this is a, a piece I came across in the New York Times this May that really made me mad. 
uh, just because it so reinforced this cliche of opposition. Um, when really, when really these groups, you know, I think of uh, the Romantics and the Enlightenment as the peanut butter and jelly of the history of ideas. They're so much stronger together. I don't. Do you eat peanut butter and jelly here? <laughs> Maybe that's just an American thing. But but you should try it if you haven't. Um, it's fantastic. And and they're so complementary. These groups. They uh, imagine being a great storyteller, but then being able to use a kind of scientific rigor to really analyze what you're doing and reproduce it in an iterative way and grow it quickly. Imagine being able to use quantitative data for that, but also driving your metrics through a kind of quali through, oh, sorry, through qualitative priorities. That could be really, really powerful. And uh, the, you know, instead of resenting uh, incursions of the Enlightenment into your sphere, into your entertainment sphere, you know, uh, uh, embracing it and making it your own. So this has happened before in a different field. I don't know how many of you recognize this man. This is Daniel Kahneman. He's a psychologist, and together with his research partner, Amos Tversky. He, uh, uh, so traditionally, a very psychologist, very qualitative, very inward looking, so kind of romantic area. But they were very interested in economics, very quantitative, predictive, kind of traditional enlightenment realm. And they were particularly interested in the assumptions that economists were making about human beings and their economic decisions. So uh, economists at that point is, were operating under the assumption that we're all perfectly rational creatures when it comes to making economic decisions. And what Kahneman and Tversky were able to prove through experiments was that this is not at all the case. And in fact, we're deeply irrational uh, uh, in a predictable way sometimes, but, but deeply irrational. And we come to all kinds of decisions with cognitive biases. And that's part of the reason for Paul Meal's book that algorithms were better than clinicians at diagnosing symptoms. Because as human beings, we come to decisions with all kinds of biases that in a lot of cases we're not even aware of. So Kahneman and Tversky completely turned economics on its head and in fact were incredibly influential and created a whole new branch of uh, a whole new discipline, behavioral economics. So it can happen. Romantics can infiltrate and have huge influence. And so what I'd like to do now is just share with you quickly three projects that, to me, feel very hopeful uh, and, or you know, give me some optimism that we can, get, we can maybe take our future in a different direction, uh, one where creatives are embracing and empowered by data and technology. Uh, this, first, uh, this first project, uh, Orange Bu Duffel Bag Initiative, is a not-for-profit focusing on kids in the foster care system. And they partnered uh, with a very talented writer, director, and experienced designer, Lance Wheeler, who I believe is here in the audience. I saw him up. Hey, Lance. Um, who didn't know I was going to be talking about him today. Um, and uh, they wanted to have a project that brought more attention and uh, awareness to kids in the foster care system. But I think Lance wanted to do something more. He wanted to see if, uh, and, and he'll correct me if I uh, misspeak. He'll correct me later when he's up speaking. Uh, he wanted to see if he could do even more than that, if he could build empathy in audiences for kids in the foster care system and use data to do that. So uh, we partnered together. And Lance created a science fiction, a dystopic science fiction allegory uh, in an immersive uh, uh, participatory experience uh, that would take audience members on 
an emotional analog ride similar to what kids in the foster care system experience. So authoritarian characters, uncertainty, um, you know, all those things that they experience. And these audience members were wired with biometric sensors for skin conductivity that gave us, that could give Lance a picture of their engagement with the narrative as the story unfolded. Now, what this allowed Lance to do, and uh, that I think is super powerful, is then iterate the narrative based on the information he was getting from one performance to the other to increase empathy with foster care kids. Now, that's a big win, I think, for everybody. I consider it a win when I feel more empathy. Um, and from the point of view of Orange Duffel Bag Initiative, uh, that's a big win too because empathy is correlated to higher engagement uh, and including volunteering and giving money. And, uh, and some of the lessons learned here in terms of shaping that narrative and building empathy can then be exported to more traditional scalable modes of communication. Uh, the second project um, I'd like to talk about is something recently launched uh, by my friend Jonah and Zay, uh, along with producer Michael Schamberg. So the traditional Hollywood model of, of making moves, uh, movies, we've all seen skew towards these big budget uh, wide release projects that create uh, a lot of risk for the studios. Now, if we look at this from the point of view of creatives, uh, while a big budget is fun to play with, really there's so much risk involved that if you talk to any, you know, writer or director in that system, they'll tell you, man, this is totally fear-based and not that fun. Uh, you know, even though there's the opportunity to reach this wide audience, there's so much pressure and such a drive to create content for, you know, a kind of average audience. Uh, as a creative, it's, it's not that promising an opportunity. So, uh, so Jonah and Zay and Michael thought, well, what if we took the BuzzFeed network of roughly 200 million monthly unique visitors and uh, treated that network as a laboratory for content creators? who were thinking of motion picture ideas, a way to test stories and characters in a kind of rapid iteration, the kind of rapid iteration that Liz was talking about earlier, um, and immediately test them on their audiences. Now, this is, the, this testing uh, is, the, the metrics used in this testing are very much creator based metrics. Uh, they happen to be aligned with the financial side of things, but BuzzFeed, that's because BuzzFeed is not interested in creating clickbait. BuzzFeed is interested in creating content that you are interested in sharing with people close to you or not close to you. That you think it's that good, it's worth sharing. So, so shares are one of the primary metrics. Um, and here you're looking at, you know, this is still in development, so this is a screenshot of a producer dashboard uh, from Eugene Yang. Uh, if Disney princesses were real, as his, <laughs> his, his uh, top piece that uh, he was exploring. Now this is a, this is a really, um, this is a producer's leaderboard here. You see Eugene's at the top there. <laughs> So if Disney princesses were real, so he's testing out this idea with audiences and he's shaped it. And this is very powerful as a creator because data can give you an input that is outside the form of what you're working on. It's an opportunity for you to test, is, this, is the reason this scene is killing it is because of this thing that I, that I say is, is making it do it? Or is it something else? You get to test yourself, and then you get to learn and improve your craft uh, in a really rapid way that, uh, that, the, that uh, the Hollywood system does not allow. 
So we're seeing uh, creatives engaged with data. We're seeing iteration, rapid iteration testing of, uh, of story. And I'm, I will uh, wrap up with one more example and, uh, um, and then quickly just talk about some attributes of, uh, of these projects. So, so at Harmony Institute, uh, as I was saying, we were working with um, a lot of big foundations and, and, and companies making heavy media investments. Uh, and that was interesting. And we were learning a lot, but we were really missing the opportunity to work with individual media producers. And that's what we really wanted to do. And we started to think about building a tool uh, for people to use so that we could incorporate our insights into that and, 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 and empower them. And in talking to uh, producers of issue-driven content, we were overwhelmingly hearing this. What do I want to know? I've just spent two years of my life pouring blood, sweat, and tears into this project, and I want to have some idea of whether it's doing anything, you know, vis-a-vis -vis this issue. Uh, and so we, you know, we had originally thought of creating a dashboard, but a dashboard's only good if you're driving 80 kilometers down the highway and you know where you are. You know, these these people didn't know where did, they weren't understanding, you know, how their project was doing in the moment. And so we realized, oh, we need to build a map. Uh, this is a this is a uh, screenshot from our beta, which is launching in January. So sneak preview. Um, so, uh, StoryPilot is a map for issue-driven content. Uh, we're starting populating it with social issue documentaries, but we plan to layer on top of that news and cause marketing content uh, so that you'll be able to look at all that, all of that, and look at the ecosystem. Um, as you're thinking about creating content around an issue, you can explore what's already there in a kind of macro view and dive down into a micro view. And the second thing that was really important with this tool was that um, a, 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 a social issue documentary like Blackfish might be interested in shutting down an industry or a practice of containing these large charismatic marine mammals for people's entertainment. Uh, a, um, a documentary like uh, The Invisible War might be seeking to uh, change the milita American military's policy on sexual assault. In that case, they would be looking at, uh, they'd be heavily focused on this bottom line here, which is uh, where we've connected to the Sunlight Institute's uh, API on congressional floor data in the United States. So we're going to be adding also a semantic analysis of uh, congressional text and, and text in bills so that you can find, so that filmmakers can find their kind of specific <laughs> linguistic construction fingerprints in this work and see their impact. Um, you might be interested in raising awareness about something. So you might be looking at mainstream media uh, and seeing where your film is getting mentioned. Or social media, seeing if you're building a movement. Or expert blogs, if you're seeking to influence some niche. So the idea was that there are different metrics. We needed to meet people where they were in their needs for uh, different metrics. So, so I brought up three three projects that give me a little hope. Um, and then uh, the question remains, you know, well, how would I recognize something going forward? Uh, and I think there are a couple, of, a couple of attributes. One is when you're using data, it forces you to get really clear on your goals. You actually have to think through, as a creative person, as an artist, you have to think through, well, what am I really trying to achieve here? Is critical, how important is critical reception to me versus vis-a-vis -vis social impact? Um, a lot of these projects take unorthodox paths to solving a problem. So, uh, you know, rather than create a PSA, 
Uh, Lance created this incredible immersive experience that literally ch deeply changed audiences. Um, BuzzFeed is creating a new rapid iterative model to uh, uh, tr the content, uh, a, a traditional, somewhat traditional form of content. Um, choosing metrics that match your goals. Uh, we see people using quantitative and qualitative data together to inform and compensate each other. And then lots and lots of iteration. So I just want to close urging creatives, urging our friends in the romantic, in the romantic group uh, to embrace data and optimization. The train is leaving the station, and you need to be on it for all our sakes. I um, want you to think about embracing data, making it your own, and making great work. Thank you.